first event of 2013. We had two great events last term about Syria and about Pakistan. Um, today's event is, is the UN passed itself by date. So with the most recent deadlock in the UN Security Council over Syria, many questions have been raised about the utility of the United Nations. It's called many to speculate whether this institution is now passed itself by date. Is it useful anymore? With no power to enforce any resolutions that are passed, does it just offer a false form of collective security? Despite this, the United Nations does hold a great amount of prestige and perceived authority in the world today. It has remained a platform to ensure dialogue and diplomacy as possible solutions to the world problems of the 21st century. It can be argued that the framework it provides for the exchange of ideas and its presence as a channel of communication is still quite important. The UN has been able to lead negotiations and it does bring issues to the world stage. And it remains the most prestigious and respected international organization in the world. So in light of all this, today we're going to seek to answer the following questions. Uh, is the United Nations still able to ensure international peace and security in today's international system? To what extent does the structure of the Security Council impede this? And we can have a little look at Syria as the most recent case study. How successful have UN peacekeeping missions really been? Do UN agencies such as UNICEF um, and UNESCO ensure that the UN remains important and relevant? Um, so without further ado, I'm going to welcome our speakers today. Um, we're very lucky to have Sir Adam Roberts, President of the British Academy, uh, Emeritus Professor of International Relations at Oxford University. He was a Montague Burton Professor of International Relations at Oxford from 1986 to 2007, and he's the author and editor of numerous articles and books. We're also very lucky to have Professor Max Burdell, Professor of Security and Development in the War Studies Department at King's. From 2000 to 2003, he was Director of Studies at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, and he's also a visiting professor at the Norwegian Defence University College. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Michael Clark has been unreachable today and won't be joining us this evening. So I'm going to hand over to our speakers. very much for this initiative and this kind invitation. It's a, it's a really great pleasure to be here and to support not just, or just not to speak on the subject, but to support um, the activities of your, of your think tank. Um, what I thought I'd do is to start, um, and I want to keep it relatively short to leave as much time as possible for, for discussion, which is probably one reason why you're here. But what I thought I'd do is to start by looking at your overarching question, and in the course of that, I'll address some of the ones you've listed as well. And the overarching question is, of course, whether the UN is passed its sell by date. Now, the first thing to say about that is that it is not a new question. I have a reference here to a US Senate committee, which found that the organization, and I quote, suffered from serious problems of overlap, duplication of effort, weak coordination, proliferating mandates and programs, and much more. Now, what's interesting about this is that the committee in question was reporting in October 1947. That is, just over two years after the United Nations was set up. And now you've organized this session as we're approaching its 70th birthday. Now, the suggestion, of course, I'm making here is not that there is nothing new under the sun, that nothing much has changed, or that the UN in the course of its history has not been confronted with qualitatively new and different challenges to which it has had to respond, and not always very effectively. Nor, of course, am I suggesting that there aren't dark stains on the history of the organization, or that its record of performance isn't highly uneven. What I am suggesting, and the point of that initial quote, is really just to say that in order to answer your central question and also to ask why the record has been so uneven, we really need to start with or to be clear about what kind of organization we are dealing with and perhaps more importantly to know what it is not 
And I think once we've done that, um, we'll be in a much better position to evaluate its record and to answer some of the more specific questions. So to this end, and for the purpose of discussion and keeping it quite brief, there are three things I'd like to highlight about the organization. Um, and from which I think very important implications flow. And I'll try to illustrate some of those specific examples. Three things. First of all, the UN is, and this might be, you know, International Relations 101 for many of you, but it is important to stress, the UN is an intergovernmental body. That is, it is not a supranational entity or an embryonic world government in waiting. It derives its authority from governments. It consists, as you know, of nearly 200 legally equal states. And they are governed in their dealings and relations with one another by the principle of sovereign equality and the rule of non-intervention. And they recognize no overarching authority, and certainly not that of the Secretary General. Now, these governments, and if we restrict it for the time being, as we will be talking about later, no doubt, the Security Council, let's say the permanent five members of the Security Council, do not always see eye to eye on issues of international peace and security, nor do they see eye to eye on which values within the Charter ought to be prioritized. And of course, when that is the case, it makes concerted action difficult. And we'll come back to that in a minute. That's the first basic point I want to stress about the organization, which we mustn't forget. The second is that the UN is an intensely political institution, and that politics international politics, but also politics within the international organization itself, is crucial to an understanding of how it works. Let me illustrate that with a specific example. It is in relation to the third of your questions about UN peacekeeping operations. Now, it's a recurring complaint and a serious problem that the UN is not able to deploy very quickly when it establishes a peacekeeping operation. In fact, for those who spend time doing the statistics on this, it takes an average of six to eight months between a resolution from the Security Council until the mission is in the field. Now, when we inquire into the reasons for this, of course, we quickly realize that it's not simply a matter, although that's part of it, of tightening or streamlining procedures, rules, and regulation. The fact is that while the Security Council, when it sets up an operation, may give its consent or assent to the cost of an operation, let's say 300 million, <coughs> the authority actually to spend money on the ground can only be approved by the General Assembly and by its various subcommittees. In other words, the General Assembly at large, which since the 1960s has been dominated by countries from the developing world, often referred to under the category of G7 to <coughs> 7 on the line, control the purse strings of the organization and not much else. So the whole process of approving these budgets is therefore intensely politicized. Another example would be, and we'll come back to that as well, no doubt as well, the way specialized agencies work. The UNHCR, the UNICEF, and all of these operational bodies, many of which do very, very good work, of course, have their own governing bodies and on those bodies sit member states, and they dish out the amount of money they get each year, and of course, therefore, they, to a degree, impose their priorities organization. So, the World Food Program, for example, gets roughly 60% of its budget from the United States. And, and, and that's an important, this intensely political character organization is another one we need to take with us. The third thing I'd like to stress is that the UN is, and that sounds uh, complicated, it isn't really, it's a functionally fragmented organization, and therefore to speak of the UN system, as you haven't done this evening, but to speak of the UN system is therefore strictly misleading, because it doesn't capture the degree to which the UN and the agencies and the bodies outside the Secretariat proper have always retained a high degree of autonomy in their operations. And that's a function in large part to the fact that they remain beholden to their donors, as I mentioned, that sit on the governing board for funding and for political support. So in other words, the UN is deeply fragmented along functional lines. And this very fact that UN agencies are separately administered makes coordination, and especially what you might call the strategic direction of UN activities. Take, for example, peacekeeping operations. Very, very difficult, an inherently difficult task. In addition to this, of course, the autonomy granted to specialized agency over time has bred a degree of institutional independence on their part, 
sometimes reflected in their institutional culture and in their political priorities. So, there we are. These three realities, of course, clearly interlinked and overlapped, intergovernmental, deeply political and functionally fragmented character, requires of us that we ask, as did Doug Hammarskjöld in his report in 1960, in a very different era, ask what are the possibilities of substantive action by the UN in a split world. He was referring, of course, to the Cold War split, but divisions of value and interest remain among member states. And, and they persist, and that is still the broad background against which we need to consider its, its role. So, quickly, what are the possibilities for substantive action? How relevant is it to the challenges we face today and as it passed itself by day? What are the implications, in other words, that flow from these features I described in the organization? Again, this will be in telegraphic and headline form, but it should stimulate discussion. Three things I'll say. The first thing I think we've learned, and I think it flows from this, is that the UN itself is neither politically suited nor structurally equipped to act as a coercive agency, that is to impose its will uh, on or a solution either on belligerents or parties to a conflict. The organization lacks both the capabilities and above all the political commitment required for enforcement to be a viable option. And instead, therefore, I think the UN is best seen and its role most effective when it is seen as a kind of service agency, a central service agency, if you like, for the international community, where it can demonstrate its functional utility for member states. Now, that utility, that usefulness, often resides within specialized agencies. The UNHCR today, unquestioned, uh, its role is doing an extraordinary job in, in Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey, where there are now some 750,000 refugees, either registered or awaiting refugees. That's one visible role for the UN agency, which it does extremely well. Less noticed, but other examples where this function of utility is almost unquestioned will be, for example, the work of the World Health Organization, in particular, its contribution to the monitoring and control of infectious diseases, as it demonstrated very effectively during the SARS epidemic in 2004. The UN's role in coordinating humanitarian relief, and I would say in organizing election. It's now almost, I think there are roughly 30 or 40 requests every year to the Secretary General for UN assistance in organizing elections. So that is the way in which I think the UN's role is likely and has been most effective. The second important role, I think, for the UN, and this touches on issues perhaps more relevant to discussion today about Syria and other things, is that the UN has played and still plays an important role in the building of norms within international society. And as such, it has played an important role in shifting the normative boundaries in international relations. This includes the justice-related provisions of the Charter, in particular with the promotion of human rights. The UN provide and has provided a framework for advancing these norms. Now, few words of caution, it is of course not easy and sometimes to measure this role and, and whether or not it has been effective and sometimes claims regarding the extent to which norms have been internalized and command widespread let alone universal support are exaggerated. One such example would be the area of humanitarian intervention and the question of whether or not a right of such intervention is now widely expect, accepted. It is, uh, it remains deeply contentious, as discussions before, during and after the NATO aid operation in Libya showed, but that does not mean that there hasn't been movement on the subject, if you like. And perhaps another example will illustrate what I'm trying to say. I'm Norwegian, as many of you know, and in 1979, Norway was, as it is occasionally, very occasionally, a non-permanent member of the Security Council. And in early 1979, there were an important, was an important debate in the Security Council about Vietnam's invasion, as you may recall, of, of Pol Pot's murderous regime in Cambodia. Now, Norway was on the Council at that time, and Norway, <coughs> and I have the verbatim records, was unequivocal and emphatic in stressing that, and I quote, the domestic politics of Pol Pot's government were entirely irrelevant to any assessment of the rights and wrongs of Vietnam's action. That action, of course, was to invade the country and expel Pol Pot's genocidal regime. Now, 
clearly there was a very complex and important Cold War context to that argument, but what I'm saying, that kind of argument advanced by the Norwegians simply couldn't be made like that today. There may be disagreements about humanitarian intervention, about whether or not and how we should operationalize the responsibility to protect, but you can no longer say or insist that the way in which a government treats its national authorities, or a national authorities treats its population, is exclusively a matter of, of domestic concern. The growing recognition, if not the unqualified acceptance, of the view that massive, and remains to be defined, of course, human rights violations are also matters of legitimate international concern, is a development which the UN has done much to, to foster and encourage. Now, that may be very cold comfort for those in Syria or elsewhere, but it's, and it is progress, but the progress of a very particular, if you like, fragmented kind. I'm sure we'll get back to that in a minute. The very last point is a little bit sort of depressing, but I didn't know what direction this, this uh, discussion would take, but I think it's worth remembering uh, and it's one of the functions of the United Nations, whether we like it or not. Uh, it is an observation that was made by former Secretary General Hugh Tant in his memoirs, when he observed, and I quote, great problems usually come to the United Nations because governments have been unable to think of anything else to do about them. Now, that's not always the case, but it very often, it has a core of truth to it. And I perhaps was reminded by this because I've had to spend a bit of time recently working again, as I have over the past couple of years, on the U.S. involvement in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It is now still the largest U.N. operation, close to 18, perhaps a bit less now, 17,000. And it does seem to me sometimes, looking at how that mission has evolved, that it is partly because great problems have arrived at it and they haven't been thinking of other ways of doing it. I'll leave it to that, and then we'll get into discussion. Thank you. Well, I'm in a difficulty. I should first of all say it's wonderful to be at King's. Uh, when I belatedly decided uh, that I needed to do some graduate studies a few years after I'd taken a degree, I wrote a letter to King's College London to one Professor Michael Howard saying, uh, are there any courses that might be relevant to me? And um, are there any scholarships to help pay for them? They didn't have any money. Uh, and actually, as fate had it, I ended up over the road at LSE where there was a scholarship, so I was always retained an affection for, for kids. The difficulty I'm in is that I agree with almost everything that Matt's has said, uh, and uh, so um, uh, I've got to try and seek out at least a slightly different angle on the same problems uh, from the one he has indicated. And I'll do that very briefly because I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on these issues. Um, I agree with him that uh, the UN has always been past itself by day. Um, indeed, I think one can put it even earlier than you did, because you were in 1947, but wasn't it in 1946 that an American senator denounced the UN uh, because the Charter was a pre-atomic age charter. And in his view, the Charter had been negotiated in the last possible month before the first test explosion of an atomic bomb in Alma Gordo, New Mexico. Uh, and so the Charter was out of date before the ink was dry on it. Uh, so um, one could add some of the uh, many spirited attacks on the UN uh, have also been uh, uh, indicating that it was past its sell-by date. Uh, Nikita Khrushchev's famous attack in 1961, that there are there may be neutral countries, but there are no neutral men. His extreme suspicion of the UN role in the Congo, uh, all of that um, indicated a view then of the UN as being uh, uh, no longer relevant to the difficult situation of world politics. Other distinguished critics of the uh, United Nations uh, include, have included Osama bin Laden uh, in a memorable statement in late 2001. Uh, so, um, uh, it, and I, I could find one even last week, an Indian diplomat 
uh, launched a rip-roaring attack on the precise issue that Matt's focused on at the end, uh, any doctrine of responsibility to protect or humanitarian intervention was seen as latter-day colonialism and the UN was seen as um, a uh, instrument of colonial powers in uh, carrying out that vision. So um, it's remarkable that it's been passed itself by date in so many different ways and for so long, uh, and yet it's actually survived longer than any other international organization. And I suspect that one reason is that um, the attacks on the UN have often been, Michael, distressingly logical. They pointed to particular and undeniable faults, and Matz was right to take a, a realistic view of those faults. But my response would be, since when was logic so important in international relations? Uh, if logic had prevailed in international relations, those of you, and there are several here who have studied in the War Studies Department, uh, might have had much less to study uh, than uh, has actually been uh, the case. Um, I think one has to be very careful about the application of logic uh, to international relations. Uh, often what it means is simply prioritizing one set of criteria over all others uh, and therefore neglecting important aspects of reality and therefore by implication neglecting a true understanding of how different countries see the international organization and the multi-dimensional ways in which it is possible to view it. Uh, so um, uh, I could just end there and say that um, past itself by date is a critique we don't need to take seriously. But that's not actually my position. I agree with Max that the criticisms of the UN have to be taken seriously and the fact that it survived them doesn't mean that you can ignore the criticism. And I just want to make a very few points here about uh, the UN system. Uh, firstly, it is commonly the case that the UN is judged by a higher standard than is reasonable. What I mean by that is it's often set up as the UN was supposed to establish world peace. We don't have world peace, therefore the UN has failed. But the important question isn't whether the UN has established world peace. The important question is whether the UN has helped in a process of restricting, restraining the use of violence and has helped in the development of global norms which might work against the easy and quick resort to violence. And uh, I agree with what Matt said about the UN's role in spreading norms of development, providing an arena norms of norms of various kinds. Um, and I was struck, I happened to be because I have relatives in Kenya, uh, in Kenya over the new year, and I was um, overhearing a conversation between uh, three um, Matata <coughs> drivers, uh, drivers of small taxis, uh, and they were speaking in Swahili, but uh, I couldn't help uh, hearing certain words which were used in English, such as Rome Statute and International Criminal Court. Uh, I thought this was, this was an interesting example of how, and, and of course it's relevant there because some of the um, candidates in the elections in Kenya are under investigation by the ICC. Uh, but it's an interesting example of our international standards may have, as it were, spread ripples and repercussions, not always for the better, uh, in a wide variety of ways. And on the central question of 
the war and the extent to which the UN has inhibited it. Um, if I was going to inflict PowerPoint on you, I would have brought, you've probably seen them, the statistics from the Uppsala Conflict Database Program, statistics that come out of both Swedish and Norwegian research programs, that show very clearly a decline in international war in the period since 1945. <coughs> Uh, and um, that decline is something that we sometimes almost don't notice because there are still so many difficult problems in the international system, so many wars, but mainly internal wars, uh, civil wars of one kind or another. Uh, but actually the decline is very striking. And I'm the first to be suspicious of the application of statistics to international relations. There's a long history of dodgy use of statistics. One of my favorite books in international relations, which I give to students who are too earnest about statistics, is one by an international history colleague, Christopher Blatt, entitled Mickey Mouse Numbers in World History, uh, which has a wonderful series of examples of the misleading application of largely bogus statistics uh, to international relations. There's something about the pseudoscience uh, <coughs> statistics which appeals and yet which may be deeply misleading if it's done badly. And it sometimes has been done badly in relation to the problem of war. And yet, I have seen no serious dissent from anybody, however suspicious of statistics, but the overall conclusion of the Uppsala conflict database program that there has been a very significant decline in international war. And when you consider that the number of states has increased in the UN period from 51 or whatever it was, now to 193, is it? Uh, it's uh, uh, a very striking <coughs> fact that the overall incidence and the number of casualties of interstate war has gone down. And one can attribute that to very many causes. I'm the last to say it's exclusively the result of the existence of the UN. You could attribute it to a growth of democracy. And if you believe in the link between democracy and uh, peace, then that's a, uh, a possible, convenient, broad brush explanation. It doesn't always work in every detailed case, but no, that is a possible explanation. Uh, you could attribute it to the development of nuclear weapons and deterrence and a general awareness that war has reached a sort of reductio ad absurdum. Uh, and uh, you could attribute it to the growth of norms, which, some of which may be independent <coughs> of the UN. You could attribute it to the memory of war. But some of it may owe something to the UN itself to the values that it enshrines, but also to the experience of the UN era, which has been that when states blatantly, one state has blatantly attacked another in cross-border aggression, at least on some of those occasions, they have been repulsed and sometimes repulsed under a UN <coughs> mandate. Uh, as with Korea, which of course happened partly because of the lucky accident that Stalin had stupidly walked out of the UN Security Council and therefore was not in a position to veto UN action. But um, that was uh, one And then of course Kuwait in 1990 1991. Uh, a very clear uh, lesson could be drawn from that, that a state that attacks, <coughs> occupies and annexes another will be repulsed. And so um, uh, that may have contributed something to the inhibitions about the use of force, the restraint on the use of force uh, in the uh, UN era. Now all of this, coming back to the theme, the UN is often judged by the wrong standard, does not mean 
the UN enshrines a system of collective security. Collective security means a system where each state will come to the aid of any other state if it, whether regionally or globally. That's the deal. And we can't be confident that that exists as a rule in the UN system. There are too many cases uh, where an attack by one state or another, uh, Israel's attack on Syria the other day might be an example, are ignored for whatever reason. Uh, there are um, many other ways in which it's not an absolute rule. What it is, however, is a system of selective security. Now that's not a great slogan. Nobody is going to be very uh, inspired by the slogan of selective security. But that is in fact what we have. The UN is inevitably and necessarily selective. And um, in my view, it's important that it should be selective. Selectivity can be a good thing as well as a bad thing. And in particular, the Security Council, in deciding which issues to get involved in and which not, has to be selected. And sometimes, of course, the issues that it chooses not to get involved in, it may encourage regional bodies to be involved in. Um, uh, sometimes uh, it uh, may ignore them completely. One of the most interesting <coughs> chapters in my own book I edited with colleagues at Oxford on the UN Security Council of War is the chapter on when it didn't. And it's quite a long chapter with lots and lots of examples. Uh, and the reasons for not intervening are various. Uh, so they're quite different from each other. Uh, some are to do with the issue not having a very high profile. Some are to do with a particular state being a protege of one of the Security Council members, and so it's not like uh, a state to allow the UN to get involved against that state, and so on. Many different reasons. But uh, that uh, system of selectivity, it seems to me, is one that is bound to continue. And we see it in Syria uh, today. And it's not just, we shouldn't fool ourselves, that the inactivity of the Western powers is due to the veto exercised by China and Russia. That has been exercised, but it's very evident, and including from recent interviews with the retiring Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, that the Western powers did not have a very clear idea or a clear commitment to do something in Syria. Uh, and they were able, to an extent, to hide behind the veto as an excuse for them. So in my view is that the system, although illogical, although imperfect, has achieved something valuable. It's now seeking to achieve <coughs> something very, very difficult, which is precisely the consequence of its success. Having had a degree of success, and it's only a degree of success, and it might go the other way. Uh, in tackling the problem of international war, the UN is having to tackle the problem of civil war. And that is notoriously a very, very difficult problem for international relations. And it could yet be the graveyard of the UN. It may one day reach itself. Uh, but selectivity is one of the weapons that we have to use in order not to be buried under the weight of all the civil wars in which it might get engaged. That's all I have to take on. Thank you. Obviously, a great deal more difficult to reform 
um, in, intergovernmental organization uh, structure than it is to say, for example, reforms within the secretary. Um, so quite a lot of things have happened and have taken place. And we can give specific examples. You know, but the UN has responded to criticism in the common and effective. But the Security Council is particularly difficult. Uh, and when I say particularly difficult, it's, it's worth drawing a distinction between the kinds of reform we're talking about. The most of the reform would be substantive reform, which is increasing the security council membership, for example. That's only been done once since one in the late 60s, and it's increased to one point of members. And it's difficult because you need two thirds majority, and because if you want to find out why it's difficult, I suppose you could go back to the, the spring of 2004, 2005, when there was a campaign for a number of countries to become members, uh, and it turned out that um, other countries. Uh, mobilized, spent much of the time, so much time actually fighting uh, the campaign of others that there was little attention given to the uh, other areas of reform. So Berlusconi famously you know, flew to Washington and told Bush that uh, this is, remember we supported you over the, uh, over the Gulf War, and now it's your turn to support us in blocking a uh, uh, in, uh, in membership for, for Germany. Um, and, and likewise, you remember there were riots in, in, in China, Japanese membership, Pakistan also had that India and so on and so forth, and the, the Japanese, uh, sorry, the, the, the Africans couldn't feel really a candidate amongst themselves, there was supposed to be five aspirants, they were only four in the way, they couldn't feel because they couldn't agree which country should represent the candidate from the membership, should it be South Africa, should it be Nigeria or Egypt. Uh, so, so there are those kinds of problems, but then there's also what you might call procedural reform, um, uh, which is reform that looks at the way in which a Security Council uh, operates and functions and works. Because one of the problems with the Security Council has long been that it's seen and has behaved like a bit of a club. And I remember, again, Norwegians being on the Security Council uh, in 2000, 2003, and occasionally, occasionally they would get a draft resolution on the discussion uh, through the meeting of the New York Times uh, before they got it from the permanent three or permanent five and discussed it separately. It was that kind of, of club, I think, being thrashed out. And quite a bit has been done to try to deal with that greater transparency in the job. So now NGOs can appear before the Security Council. Troop contributors for peacekeeping operations regularly meet with the Security Council. There are various formulas that have been developed. The RS formula, we can have consultations. The Security Council goes out on missions and so on and so forth. Um, now that is to address this perception that it is a club. It is to address what the scene as sort of legitimacy, sort of deficit of the organization. And of course, it won't always, um, uh, it won't satisfy everyone, certainly not those who want permanent membership. It's perhaps also worth um, adding to this that there are other sorts of, I mean, the charter and the way things work in the UN, it's a very flexible document. And things evolve all the time, so certain costume is sort of rules develop. And if you look at who has been given uh, non permanent membership, certain countries keep coming back to a non permanent status more regularly than others, than the Japanese and the Germans, for example. I've got back to that seat much more often than, say, the Norwegians or the Swedes, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, again, it might not satisfy their craving for a permanent status, uh, but it is one way of, of, of addressing, if you like, um, what's seen as a wider problem. So I do think there are real issues about um, structurally about Security Council reform, and we can you know, go on about this, whether what were to happen if it were to increase it. Um, we have a, a, a colleague. Um, other than myself in the United States called Ed Luck, uh, who has written to that book Adam referred to, who says, like ourselves, we, we don't believe this is a social science um, and the logic applies, and there are no fast rules. But he says if there's one rule in the study of international organization that's reasonably you know, solid one is that whenever you increase the number of members of a European or organization, it tends to become less effective. I'm not saying that necessarily would be the case if the increased membership of the Security Council, but there is that issue of, of, of <coughs> Increasing membership and effectiveness. And there are all the recent additions to the family of UN institutions, the Peace Building Committee, for example, set up in 2005, which uh, has been hampered um, by the sort of political compromises made in terms of the structure. So that's a very long sort of answer, but I do think we need to make a distinction between the kind of reform we're talking about, and the real difficulties in terms of, of getting, um, whatever, whichever way we look at it. I mean, I there are books can be written about the different suggestions of how to do this the right way. But there remains a fundamental problem. And that's not to say that there isn't you know, a, a, a problem, but that many people feel this is deeply, deeply unjust. Yes, I, I, I think it is preposterous that India and Japan 
just to take two examples, are not permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, some of the difficulty has been gradually alleviated in the course of the debate in the past 10 or 12 years, because it seems now, correct me if I'm wrong, to be accepted that any new permanent members would not have the veto power. So you would not be increasing the number of vetoes. You might be increasing the overall numbers of the Security Council, but not uh, the uh, veto. Uh, so um, that's one constructive development. But I agree with Max, it's still, despite that, very difficult to get change. And the problem can be put at its simplest, that the Turkeys have to vote for Christmas. Uh, the permanent members of the Security Council, the present five veto wielding powers, can veto any charter change. They can therefore veto any additional permanent uh, seat uh, on the Security Council. And what China, China is actually, I think without doubt, the most militant state against expansion of the Security Council. Why? Because the two, with not the strongest candidates, and all the strong candidates, are neighbours of China with which it has had a difficult relationship. And it's not surprising that China should have that degree of scepticism. And in a way, it's tribute to the seriousness with which China takes the UN, values it, and it takes the trouble to uh, oppose uh, expansion. And um, <coughs> it has done it by the particularly appropriate China, clever means of encouraging popular street demonstrations uh, on issues such as Japan school textbooks, where I think the actual situation in Japanese school textbooks may be being simplified a bit, uh, but the complaint that Japan hasn't really come to terms with uh, the history, its history pre and during the Second World War uh, hasn't really made amends in the way that Germany has. Um, that argument is not entirely without foundation, even if it is overplayed in China. But the result is that there is a sort of stalemate on the issue. Uh, and um, uh, it's, the change is going to come by different means such as on a range of security, even on security related issues, other bodies may be involved in making important discussions and decisions, uh, and not only the Security Council. We've seen some examples of that, where, um, for example, at the end of the Kosovo War, a number of powers were involved in negotiations about how that war should end beyond the existing government of the Security Council. And the G, whatever it was, <laughs> could never keep count of the number. The G, G10 or whatever, was, was uh, uh, involved in that, in, in that uh, process. So I, uh, that's an example of, of what Max was talking about, really, that subtle evolutionary change is more likely than fundamental uh, charter change. But I can still, if I was an Indian or a Japanese, I would still be pressing for charter change. But I think I would do it by a slightly different method for what they do. In the case of the Japanese, I would openly recognize that the way to get a change in the UN charter on this is through a full-blooded reconciliation with China. And that's going to be very difficult to achieve, take a long time, but there's no other way of doing it. And for India, um, one thing that might be necessary there is actually to have its diplomatic service, which is tiny. Uh, because if you want to be an effective member of uh, the Security Council, you, uh, in an era where the main form of warfare is civil wars or very localized uh, conflicts, such as we see in uh, uh, Central and Eastern Africa, 
there uh, you need to have a very large, well-trained diplomatic service as well as other journalistic reports, etc., to keep you very well informed as to what's going on. And uh, as I say, India's diplomatic service is tiny, and I would advocate building that service up as one means of building up credentials to be able to get it. Well, I think when I, when I uh, said that it's a sort of problem which has been left in a way on the back burner as convenient, I think it's very interesting to look at the way in which that particular operation, the UN operation that evolved, um, which was after the, what's now known as the first Congo War in 1999, it sent a very small monitoring and observer mission with a very limited mandate to implement um, the initial, you know, not implement, to monitor and observe the initial piece of that, of course, um, didn't uh, lead, get anywhere. Uh, there was intense and increased fighting over the next three years. Uh, and in particular, there was increased targeting of, you know, a great deal of targeting of civilian populations. So the UN was increasingly drawn into you know, the protection of, of civilians as part of the peacekeeping mandate. And that's really when that became a specific part of the mandate. The first specific mandate was 99. First Sierra Leone, then the King operation, and that was initially the secretariat said this is not you know, something we have the resources to do, but of course they had very little choice but to do it. And increasingly over time, now that is the key role for them, and there's been various adjustments to the mandate and an increase in the size now to the mandate. Um, the latest report I read um, was one that came out just before Christmas by Oxfam um, about the state. Of, uh, in Eastern Congo in particular, where they talk specifically about the protection of civilians of the state and the civilian communities, and their assessment is that the situation is as bad as not worse than it's ever been in the of Eastern Congo. So, on that score, we know how we seem to be in great success. And there are all sorts of issues about the use of force and those of interest and perils of Congo. In terms of moving the process forward, I mean, I'm not, there's no bullet uh, in a point, no, no sort of solution, silver bullet here, but I do think that what needs to be done is to engage in a very different way than has been done so far, the neighboring states, the key actors around, Rwanda, Uganda, and other states, and really bring them to the negotiating table to begin to look at the solution. Now, you know that it's very, very complex for a variety of reasons. It goes back to, to the Rwandan genocide, the very profound and legitimate sense of guilt that many feel, not least the American administration, about the way in which they stood by when the, when the genocide took place, and therefore, what many feel they're given or turned a blind eye to, to <coughs> Obama's policies since, and that was by the academics and all sorts of things. And it's, it's, it's a real sort of issue. But Susan Rice, as you know, who is, who was, uh, who is now, who didn't become Secretary of State, but who is at the UN, was one who was very difficult to look around the government for a mixture of reasons. And it's made it difficult for them to bring pressure. But given that, which is pretty clear now, that the continuing role of the Given the fact that there is still a significant FDLR presence with genocide, it's not, not an inventive bit entirely. Given that the war has become economized in the sense now there's a very strong political economy and logic to it, um, the UN has lost track effectively of the number of armed groups in Eastern Congo. Uh, I don't think that there is no option but to take this sort of broad diplomatic, uh, if you like, whatever you want to call it, a regional sort of action, much, much more soon than it than in the past. Uh, at the moment, it's an every six months and renew of the mandate. A threat two years ago that now is the time to leave. Of course, when they realize how bad it is, they stay on, renew it again. And the UN ends up having you know, a very, very significant mission there with, if you accept Oxfam reading, um, not a appreciable improvement situation in Eastern Congo. That's, you know, the huge important issue, but there are lots of them that it's now to me. Responsibility to protect or uh, 
because it's uh, the responsibility to protect uh, defend universal values. So can you be selective uh, and defend universal values? Well, the, the doctrine of responsibility to protect uh, itself contains some elements of selectivity. Uh, for example, it is based on a proposition. What, what differentiates it from notions of a right to humanitarian intervention is based on a proposition that is basically the job of the government concerned to protect the population. And only in really exceptional cases when it completely fails to do that and the government is in itself is itself the problem it does the uh, uh, responsibility to protect transmute into some kind of responsibility of others to intervene and there's bound to selectivity in the judgment of whether or when that situation uh, has been reached uh, in any case, we, we have seen uh, over Syria. It's not surprising, absolutely clear, that states will not intervene in a situation, even if hideous uh, events are taking place. If they have no clear strategy, no clear allies, or if the costs would be intolerably high. It's bound to be the case that prudence remains an important consideration in international relations. Uh, Burkean uh, prudence is still something that is quite fundamental to the conduct of states, and in my view, ought to be so. There's nothing wrong with the principle of uh, prudence. I have mixed feelings about the doctrine of responsibility. Uh, I had some small part in the work of the Canadian Commission to help to develop the concept. It is, in many ways, an improvement on the previous debate about a right of humanitarian intervention. It struck me as problematic for many reasons. But um, if responsibility is defined in terms of the, of the responsibility to protect civilians, and that's how it is generally defined. We've heard over Democratic Republic of Congo how difficult the mandate of protecting civilians actually is. Uh, it's extraordinarily difficult. And um, when people say that in the case of Libya, NATO cynically hijacked the UN resolution which required the protection of threatened inhabitants of Benghazi against the depredation of the Gaddafi forces. Um, I think it's easy to underestimate the near impossibility of a mandate of protecting civilians at the best of time, let alone when the intervening force has explicitly said, I'm not putting boots on the ground, and they're going to operate from the air. You can't do it in the form of protecting all civilians. And um, I've never seen a plan for how that is supposed to be done. What you can do, and this is highly controversial, and in a UN forum I would probably not dare say it, is you can take sides in a civil war. And it actually needs really serious thought. Because if you have allies on the ground with whom you can operate, you have a chance of influencing the situation in a way that you do not if you have no allies. And in part, the story of what went wrong in Bosnia in 1994 and what went right in Bosnia in the summer of 1995 is the difference between a UN force operating more or less independently and claiming to protect civilians in the safe area and then after the Bosnian Serbs had stupidly overreached themselves, uh, Srebrenica in 1995 had criminally overreached uh, then uh, the UN forces, including the Rapid Reaction Force outside Sarajevo, and, the, and NATO through its Operation Deliberate Force 
campaign in August, September 1995 could uh, be effective because at last they were actually taking sides. And they ended the siege of Sarajevo or contributed to the ten. Uh, so, so I think it's an issue that has been avoided in the UN system because it is a really <coughs> complicated. And yet, if you want to look for serious results, be it in Somalia today uh, or in many other cases, you need to be thinking about with whom you, you might need to ally to have results. Can I just uh, add one thing? To that, and, uh, and just to echo and reinforce that, uh, having again looked a bit closely at the whole debate about the protection of civilians, it's not just that it's very difficult, almost impossible, to actually provide a credible mandate for protecting civilians. If you look at the size of Congo, there are all sorts of requirements. But what you also do when you say that you are going to protect civilians is that you do raise expectations and that that kind of protection will be provided. Uh, you putting pressure on the force which is there, the UN force, already overstretched, to take on responsibilities uh, which it is impossible to satisfy to everyone's, um, and so everyone is pleased. And the result is actually to aggravate um, the, the situation on the ground for civilians. And that's happened in two ways in the case of Congo, because he couldn't possibly do it alone, the UN, so he turns to the you know, national forces in place, which is the Congolese army, um, and entered into a very, very complicated and dodgy relationship with the Congolese army, supposedly having demobilized it and gone through security sector reform. But clearly none of that had actually happened. And as you probably remember, the UN was in a, in a very, very difficult spot when evidence came out of massive violations committed by the Congolese army as part of its operation, supported by the UN, came up with and the other thing as well, of course, is that if you cannot provide proper protective civilians, then you can perhaps provide it in one particular spot. And this is, of course, one of the lessons from Operation Artemis. You remember in Burnia? The French were very effective in you know, bringing stability and peace to Burnia. They had a very restricted area operation and were going to get out uh, within two months. And they're very clear about that. And as the local UN civilian uh, commander wrote later in a very interesting article, you know, we didn't associate atrocities with the place, but that was moved out to it. It happened everywhere else because in a way it increased predation of the local civilian population that the UN couldn't be. Uh, okay, it doesn't mean that um, there isn't a real issue about the need to protect civilians, but if that becomes a sole focus rather than a broader political level of the mission, you are going to be trouble. And it's perhaps interesting in the case of Libya, isn't it, that you have this very strange op-ed piece written one month after the operation started by the four Western leaders that we're not actually doing this because of regime change. But, by the way, this will not actually end until the death is gone. So, so, but in a way, they had a point, because that was a rude cause that they saw it, and you could argue, where are we today in Libya? But the point is that you mustn't divorce the discussion of civilian protection uh, from you know, the broader political end state and what, where you want to go. And that's why I'm concerned about all these conferences that are just about civilian protection. And they show how we're better at you know, providing support here. And then the big issue is that this is only going to be addressed once we have uh, a movement, whether that's to take sides in the conflict. And I entirely agree with um, Adam's reading of what happened in Bosnia. And we just have to add to that that's a very complex moral calculus involved in that. Um, but, but those are the sort of very stark alternatives. Um, sadly, the UN um, gets dumped with a problem on the ground. And for the, if you're interested, there's some. Despairing and interesting articles written by the UN mission commander just about the feeling these different pressures and what he had to do, um, and clearly not in a position to do so. But all the while, expectations and this fact that RTP has been merged effectively in the discussions that we need to take hasn't helped uh, in any way. Uh, back? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about the Are you worried about implications for the U.S. credibility, so perhaps the 
the existence of all those hazards helps to explain why so often it's very late that the decision is made that it's best to take <coughs> sides. Um, maybe we, uh, this is the awful truth about Yugoslavia, maybe we had to go through Srebrenica uh, in order to get a situation where people would understand that uh, it was time the UN put some muscle in support of the Bosnian government and stop these atrocities. Had the UN taken that position much earlier in support of the Bosnian government, uh, it might easily have been accused of all the things that you mentioned uh, and more. And so while I'm saying that the issue of taking sides has to be considered, I am absolutely not urging that uh, the UN should rush to take sides in every civil war uh, that takes place. But uh, there are dangers to the credibility of international bodies when they don't take sides as well as when they do. Um, and for example, unfortunately, um, in the really complex and difficult situation in Sri Lanka where there aren't any uh, simple, uh, uh, were, no obvious good guys and um, uh, bad guys. Yes, there may be bad guys, but there are uh, any sides that represent vir pure virtue. Um, the, nonetheless, the non-involvement of outside bodies in the conflict and the, the impartiality of the Norwegian observers was itself problematic. Because in a civil war, to be impartial, as between the government and an insurgent, is going to be taken by the government, and very likely by the majority population, as conniving in the destruction of the country. And that was roughly the situation, as it's caricaturing it a bit, that arose in Sri Lanka, and contributed to a politics in Sri Lanka of to hell with international opinion, we're going to finish this off. Uh, so there are dangers both ways, both with deciding to uh, take sides, but also with not deciding to take sides. Would you like to comment? But no, I, don't, I, I want to give you a chance to ask a question, but just to add very, very quickly that um, when there is a crisis or an emergency or a conflict um, and violence begins to escalate, I mean, the default response very often from the Security Council would be, or from the national community, would be at all costs to try to negotiate and reach a ceasefire. And you'll have that refrain, which you can understand where that comes from. But there are circumstances and situations where if you are not prepared to do more than just that, you've got to think very carefully about the consequences are of that. And I'm thinking specifically, having tried to look a bit at the at the sort of documents surrounding um, you know, what was happening on the ground, the, the evolving genocide in Rwanda uh, in, in 1994, where it is, again, the default position, the immediate reaction was to call for a genocide, sorry, was to call for a, a ceasefire, when in actual fact, what happened was, uh, was uh, that the genocide was only brought to an end once one part in the conflict went to the point one decisively. And when I'm saying I'm looking more carefully at the documents, it's very clear from some of the cable traffic that I looked at, it was pretty early uh, that they realized that this was not a, you know, another you know, mindless, if you like, uh, a civil war in which you could make sense of who was in one to the other. It was very clear early on from the reporting back in New York that this was an organized campaign uh, of uh, eliminating one so that you against the other. But the, the demand for you know, ceasefire will cost persisted uh, for another you know, six to seven or eight weeks. And you have to ask yourself whether you know, um, that was the right response uh, given those particular circumstances, um, rather than letting the Roman Patriarch reform get on with uh, occupying and controlling the There are all sorts of complex politics involved in this, about the Security Council, about the attitude of France and Belgium, and so on and so forth. But I was struck by the extent to which um, insisted that this is essentially 
civil war with these that are out of control for you know, being a ceasefire because no one can talk about other things. You know, clearly that wasn't the idea to that plan. And I think there are other examples where, again, we have to think very carefully about what the responsibilities are. Um, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I was wondering about this taking sides as well because um, you started out with the example of Libya where you would say that taking sides uh, was a, a good thing. Um, but I would also say that the fact that the international community very clearly took sides was in a way undermining the responsibility to protect because that's not really what the whole concept was designed for. So uh, my question would be, would you maybe need some kind of different tool as the UN to uh, deal with these situations where you, you don't really want to, to impose uh, responsibility to protect because you can't really directly protect civilians and you need to take sides. But you can't also really say in some conflicts that uh, you're protecting international security or that you're acting in self-defense. And then what tool would you use? And I think that in the Rwandan genocide, that's a very clear example where R2P would be a very effective concept had it existed. Um, but maybe for a situation like Libya, or maybe even for now, <coughs> France's intervention in Mali, uh, you, you might say, is that actually legitimate under the current tools that you have as a UN? So, how do you feel about that, and do we need a different tool? I think if you take the examples you cited, um, Libya is a very clear case, but uh, Rwanda 94 and other, let's be blunt about it. There was an understandable reluctance uh, to get directly involved with forces on the ground in both cases. And um, it's for a, a mixture of motives. Prudence is one. Uh, a sense that your forces are already overstretched in some other conflict is another form of inhibiting factor. Um, Rwanda, of course, happened just after the United States had suffered hideous uh, reverses in Somalia. Having intervened in Somalia in 92, believing that this was uh, the first of what might be a, a new wave of UN authorized interventions that would uh, enable Western powers, particularly, to bring to an end internal conflicts, it all ended in tears. Um, and <clears throat> granted, that basic fact of the nervousness about intervening. And it was true of other countries as well, not just Western Europe. Because despite the mythologizing that has occurred since about Rwanda, the fact is that the Security Council did appeal for increased forces to go to Rwanda, and no country, absolutely no country, wanted to send them. There is now no country that thinks the forces should not have been sent. Every country take, accepts Rwanda as the extreme case where something should have been done. But at the time, not a single country <coughs> offered to send forces to Rwanda when an appeal had been made. Um, so against that background of prudence, the choices that are available for any kind of exercise of a responsibility to protect are distinctly limited. And I'm not in any doubt at all, as Matt will say, that <clears throat> the only way of bringing an end to the genocide in Rwanda at that time was by supporting the Rwanda Patriotic Front uh, and enabling it to oust the regime in Kigali. And it is an interesting fact that often, but sadly not always, forces that engage in vile atrocities uh, end up being defeated. Um, uh, think of those who launched the attacks at Srebrenica, <coughs> the Bosnian Serbs, ended up uh, then facing the, the uh, near humiliation of having to accept the settlement, which was very far from what they had originally uh, wanted. Think of the Rwandan regime kicked out by the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Uh, it may not always happen, it may not now happen in Syria, we don't know. Uh, 
But in a way, um, we sometimes take an unduly pessimistic view about international politics because it is very difficult to respond to extremely violent forces. But when they ex engage in excesses of that kind, it does tend to unite others against them. Uh, and uh, with the results that we see. That isn't a complete answer to your question of how better could it have been done. But I'm really indicating that there are severe constraints that might prevent the emergence of a new model where international forces can act, as it were, entirely independently in protecting uh, an endangered society. I just very quickly to add, um, what, what Libya does raise and other operations raise is something which Adam mentioned this Canadian support of the Commission of the Commission on Sovereignty and Intervention in 2001 2002. They also talked about whether or not one thing is to intervene, to take action, but whether there's also responsibility once that intervention has been completed. They sort of post, you know, use post belly. Whether you then have certain responsibilities in terms of ensuring that um, the political trajectory and so on and so forth. And of course, many would argue that. Um, air power in particular provides, you know, as David Cohen said, um, it's attractive because it's instant gratification without, um, you know, long-term commitment. It's a bit like modern culture, you said. And there is always that particular danger um, that you might think we've solved a particular and urgent problem, um, but that there are others uh, that will that blow back as the expression has it in, in, in your face. And many would argue that, you know, Libya today is in a very, very precarious situation in terms of its, you know, long-term capabilities. I mean, it is a thing we've heard. Is not, has not an effect. So it might be sometimes attractive um, uh, to intervene, you might have to do it. And I do think in the case of, of Libya, I do genuinely believe this wasn't a, you know, a case of a conspiracy for regime change. There was a real concern that Gaddafi, which Gaddafi himself had been very much encouraged by his rhetoric, would be, you know, Srebrenica and North Africa, and therefore one had to act urgently. Um, and that was immediate response, and that's why, you know, we, a few weeks later, the leaders uh, got that particular um, there's, been, thank, there's been a lot of discussion around humanitarian intervention. <coughs> well, I wanted to kind of shed light or get an insight into where do you feel that the UN has gone right or wrong in terms of institution building in post conflict um, states? So, for example, Congo, when the conflict in Somalia ends, in Somalia as well. Where do you, what role do you feel the UN can play? In terms of providing long lasting institutions that provide a central government to prevent a lot of these failed states from becoming a failed again. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think that's a sort of very, very tough question, but I'm trying to see how I want to approach it. I think the first thing to say is that not to adopt a sort of templated approach to it. And to think that there is a one-size-fits-all way of rebuilding countries that have been through a period of protracted war and violence, and that that sounds like a sort of obvious, you know, truism to make. But it's it, it is the case that very often the UN has sort of ignored that particular fact, and it's applied ways of doing things to very different contexts very unsuccessfully, um, or with you know disastrous consequences. I think Sergio de Mello, if you remember the late um, Brazilian top UN diplomat uh, said as much when he wrote about his move from Kosovo, uh, where he was in charge of the operation, to East Timor. And he said it took some time before he realized, and he brought the whole staff with him from Kosovo, that this was a very different uh, a situation, a very different challenge. So in a way, that is simply to say that one needs to be very mindful of, of, of the local realities. Um, and, and try to build, you know, local legitimacy for, for, for one's operation. And it's very, very sort of context uh, specific. Perhaps the best way of illustrating answering the question is by a, a, a specific example, um, which I would deem, you know, successful. And I had occasion to, to look at it again because I had to write a chapter to us on UN history or, a, or UP history of peacekeeping. And that's the case of Mozambique. <coughs> And Mozambique um, had emerged out of a truly horrific civil war. We tend to associate the worst sort of mutilations and atrocities that had happened in West Africa in the 90s, but much of it had happened 
the 1980s. Uh, and it was written about in US Congressional Reports and elsewhere. It emerged from that conflict in 1992. And then it had a UN operation, which was far from sort of uh, perfect uh, in terms of its sort of technically carrying out its mission. It was delayed for a year and so on and so forth. But it, it was uh, a successful operation, not just in the short term, where it was in sharp contrast to uh, uh, operations elsewhere at the time, but also in the long term. Mozambique had four parliamentary elections, it's had steady growth, its dependence on foreign aid has been reduced from 90 to 45 percent. Uh, and perhaps most of all, the integration of former combatants, specifically on the renowned side, has been largely successful. And it's very unlikely, and indeed people, most people say it's unlikely that we'll ever go back to civil war. So I have to think, you know, why was this a successful operation? And I think there were a number of things. They were able to learn lessons from what had happened in Angola uh, in, in a way that, you know, perversely um, benefited that particular operation. But also, and this is where we come back to the issue of the Security Council, it had very strong and undivided Security Council support um, for whatever action the UN locally took uh, on the ground. And that's the third element, is that the UN action on the ground uh, was very improvised and responsive to local circumstances. It was led by a man called Aldo Aiello, who flouted the UN rules completely. He had a very clear strategic objective with his operation, and that was to make sure that the Renamo did not return to the bush. And he would do whatever was needed to do that. And in his case, that meant essentially getting money from, from Italy and give that to Renamo, make sure they were on board. Now that is interesting because, and I spoke to someone who worked there at the time, that Shisano, who was a Fulimo leader, said that that wouldn't have been possible if the International Criminal Court had been around at the time. But he knew this. His priority was to make sure that Renamo came in and could build trust and, and improvise on the ground. So it's a very strange kind of template, but it was sufficient resources. It was trying to get um, the parties uh, bo on both sides to develop a vested interest in law. You see that there was something in the political process. And it was improvisation um, from the UN side. Uh, and it was an informal amnesty operating as well, which made that possible. There are many other reasons as well. The fact that the country didn't have natural resources to prosecute the conflict endlessly, a genuine war weariness. Um, but there are some interesting lessons uh, to, to learn from that. Um, it isn't an entirely satisfactory answer to, to the broader question, but it does, does give a... I think avoiding template solutions is difficult. I don't even I've got a question in, in reference to the um, United Nations and law um, with regards to the ICC and ICJ. Um, how successful do you think that these institutions have been and do you think that they are a prospect for the UN in the future and whether maybe a more successful um, application of international law in these two institutions could kind of alleviate the UN out of the crisis, out of the crisis it's in and whether the, these two institutions could contribute to a more successful UN in the future? I think both the institutions you mentioned, the International Court of Justice, which exists to uh, address disputes between states, and the International Criminal Court, which exists to prosecute uh, mainly war criminals of various kinds, um, do have a part to play. Um, it's not always an unambiguous good. Um, there may be uh, difficulties. For example, it is at least arguable that in some conflicts, the knowledge that you're being investigated by the International Criminal Court could make a belligerent less rather than more likely to enter the political realm. Because if uh, he, and it usually is a he, senses that they are um, liable to be uh, arrested, uh, that makes them nervous about changing to a, a political role. And, uh, one of the aspects of the Rome Statute that does worry me is the lack of explicit reference to amnesty. Amnesty is a very ancient method of statecraft. Uh, and Indeed, it's a, a, a slightly strange world 
where Amnesty International, which was formed to get people out of prison, now spends a certain amount of time trying to get people into prison. Uh, different people, it's true, are people who may well deserve prison. But it, it, there could be problems there. And sometimes, too, it may be the case that the International Court of Justice may <coughs> cause problems um, as well as resolve it. Uh, for example, uh, there are some aspects of its judgment on the wall, or rather its advisory opinion on the wall between Israel and the Palestinian inhabitants that I find worrying. Like it has said that um, a conflict between a state